Yeah, hello everyone. Kia ora. Um, depending on where you are, good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever it is. I am obviously not Kevin Mackay. Um, I, my name is Anna Palantin. I work with Kevin here at Neva and I'm one of the advisors in the technical committee here for the center. And I will be the moderator for this afternoon's session, first session today. Um, and uh, while there's still a few coming in, um, maybe if Brooke is online, if you could take control and set up your presentation so that we can start once everyone is here. OK, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, that's all good. So yeah, welcome right. to Dr. Brooke Tozer from GNS Science uh, up the valley here in Wellington. Um, who will talk to us about the um, SRTM 15 plus model that he's been involved in. Brooke, please. So I, should get start I should get started? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Brooke Tozer. Uh, so I'd just like to start by thanking Kevin for inviting me along to the meeting and to give this presentation. Um, so what I'm going to be speaking about is this global satellite derived predicted bathymetry model that I've been involved in generating as part of this SRTM 15 plus project, uh, which is based out of David Soundwell's lab in Scripps in San Diego. And so um, we provide these predicted depths to GEBCO to be used as the base layer for the GEBCO grid to fill in areas where there isn't any other data coverage. Um, and so I was asked if I could give a presentation on sort of how these predicted depths are generated. Um, and given that we're sort of limited on time, I'm going to focus almost sort of entirely on a high level overview of the processing recipe we use for this. And so hopefully um, it will be just detailed enough um, that we'll be able to get through it all. And also by the end of it, you may sort of have a better idea or feel for where these depths um, come from. OK, so just as a little bit of an introductory outline into the concepts that we'll be discussing. So we're going to move through this process from taking these satellite altimetry measurements and creating these um, along track uh, sea surface slope profiles um, from which we derive uh, these north component and east component grids of the sea surface slope or deflection of the vertical. And then that's used for generating these marine gravity anomaly maps. Um, from which we can then derive finally um, the predicted bathymetry. And so I'll try to spend most of the time talking about this final step, um, but we just need to go through the first stuff as sort of a precursor to that. Um, so just briefly the, to go over the altimetry technique. So basically as these satellites are orbiting, orbiting around the Earth, they're sending out these um, radar pulses. And so they're reflecting off the sea surface and returning to the satellite. And what we're interested in doing is measuring this, uh, this distance called the range here um, between the satellite and the sea surface. And so um, to provide a range accuracy that's um, that's good enough to be useful for deriving the marine gravity anomaly, we actually need to average out thousands of these returns um, per grid cell to sort of beat down the random noise or the, the time varying, com varying component of the sea surface that comes from oceanographic effects like sea surface waves. Um, and so it's kind of important to note that if you want to uh, derive sort of the instantaneous height of the sea surface relative the, to, the G, uh, to the ellipsoid, um, that there are a lot of other things that you need to factor in and correct for, such as delays through the ionosphere of the of the radar pulse. Um, but the real trick here is for our purpose is that if you just want to derive the gravity field, all that we're really concerned about is, um, is measuring the along track slope of the sea surface. And so to sort of make that a little bit more intuitive, if we take this simple example here and imagine a satellite altimetry profile across this cross section. So out here we have flat seafloor and the standard gravity vector, vector. And as we move towards a seafloor feature like the seamount, um, you can imagine that the gravitational attraction of that seamount is going to add to the, um, the usual Earth's gravity field um, and is going to result in the ocean water actually coalescing around it and causing these slopes in the sea surface that reflect the underlying seafloor topography. And so it's really measuring um, these sea surface slopes along these altimetry, tra altimetry tracks. That's the important um, component here. And so the aim of the game really is to create these grids of these northern and eastern components of the sea surface slope that is accurate as possible. Um, so that will sort of create a gravity anomaly map that's as accurate as possible from which we can derive the uh, predicted bathymetry. And so 
the basic recipe here is to take these sea surface slope measurements. So shown here are sea surface slopes for ascending tracks of this one altimeter altica um, plotted as wiggle traces. So each one of these black lines is one of these satellite altimetry profiles and the wiggles um, reflect the sea surface slope. So you can see these deviations here where there are seamounts and things um, south of the Hawaiian island chain here that we're using as an example. And so what we do is we combine all of these sea surface slope measurements from the seven altimeters that we have available to create these um, northern and eastern component grids, um, so that what it, which we term the deflection of the vertical. And then we have this physical relationship um, from potential theory that relates these um, deflections to the marine gravity anomaly. So that's great. So that's sort of the first overarching step in this process. Um, but what we're sort of interested in here is how do we go from this marine gravity anomaly that's measured at the sea surface uh, to predicting the underlying seafloor bathymetry. And so what we need to sort of first consider is how the gravity anomaly is related to the seafloor topography. And the main sort of uh, geological process at play here is this thing called isostasy. And this relates how the tectonic plate or the lithosphere um, compensates loads on its on, on the plate. So for example, if we imagine a small seamount um, sitting on this oceanic plate. If it's very small, the plate uh, the plate strength is great enough to support the entire load. And so the, uh, uh, the gravity anomaly that we observe will really reflect um, the seafloor feature. So that's really great and makes things quite simple. But the problem is, as we move to larger loads, um, the plate can no longer support that load and it will actually flex to compensate for that load. And so what that means in terms of the gravity anomaly that we observe is that we now have these uh, this sort of competition between the mass excess of the load and its compensation. And so that makes the gravity anomaly that we observe um, a lot more complicated. Um, and so then if we move to even, an even larger feature, uh, for example, an oceanic plateau, um, these features are actually what we what we term fully compensated, in which the mass excess um, and the mass deficiency from its compensation basically completely cancel out, and we just see these gravity anomalies at its edges. And so, what does this mean in terms of being able to take the gravity anomaly and predict bathymetry? Well, we can sort of think about this in the in the frequency domain, and we have this area. Um, which we term the uncompensated band, and it's only really safe to predict bathymetry um, in this band. So for these cases where we have small seafloor features, um, where the gravity anomaly is really reflecting those features, and we really can't um, we can't safely predict bathymetry for these um, much larger features. And so what we end up with is this band where we have removed the very long wavelength, so this red zone here, and we also have to move, remove the very short wavelengths because the gravity anomalies that they produce, um, these very small features, are too small for us to measure uh, sufficiently at the sea surface. So the gravity anomaly is just below that noise level in our altimetry measurements. And so then what we can do is we can um, come up with a simple formula um, that our total predicted bathymetry is going to be some long wavelength um, bathymetry that will derive from ships, plus this band passed gravity anomaly that will be passed through this filter here, multiplied by some scaling factor to convert the gravity to bathymetry. And so to sort of go through that processing flow, what we're looking at here in, in gray is all of the available ship tracks we have. So these multi-beam swaths you can see um, coming away from the Hawaiian Islands here. There's also a lot of single beam tracks that are kind of harder to see. And what we do is we, we grid up um, the bathymetry from those tracks, and then we pass it through this, this filter to get rid of all the short wavelengths. So with a cutoff of 160 kilometers. And what we end up with is this very long wavelength smooth um, seafloor map. And so then what we wanna do is take out gravity anomaly that we've measured at the sea surface and um, apply this technique called downward continuation to basically take the gravity we measure at the sea surface and downward continue it and sort of drape it over the over that long wavelength um, topography that we were looking at earlier and so when we do that we're also applying this filter to get rid of the long wavelengths from the gravity anomaly and the very short wavelengths from the gravity anomaly and we end up with something that looks like this and so now you can see that the gravity anomaly really is reflecting seafloor features so we see all these seamounts and fracture zones and things and so really then the final step is to convert that gravity anomaly into a bathymetry and so what we need is the scale scaling factor. And where that comes from is by co-locating um, bathymetry measurements made by ships 
and um, with uh, the gravity anomaly at those grid cells and plotting that up, we can just take the slope of the regression through those to come up with the scaling factor S. Yes. And then we, it's, it's a simple process of multiplying the gravity anomaly by that scaling factor and converting it to bathymetry. And so then finally, we have our predicted bathymetry here. And so this is the combination of that long wavelength um, bathymetry from ships plus this bandpass gravity converted to uh, bathymetry. And so this is um, this is done at one arc minute resolution. And so then there's one more final step which we uh, term polishing, and that's to add in all of the available shipboard data um, at the high resolution of 15 arc seconds um, where it's available and try to smooth, smoothly transition into the background predicted bathymetry. And so to do this, we use this process, um, this remove, interpolate, restore process. And so basically, um, the steps are to first remove the predicted depths from the measured depths, um, which will leave us with these uh, depth residuals, and then we interpolate those residuals onto um, a grid, and then basically add those residuals to the predicted bathymetry. And so what that does is mean that um, where we have shipboard data, the bathymetry will reflect the depths in that measured shipboard data, but will also transition smoothly into the background bathymetry. And that's a really important processing step when creating these global grids, because if you imagine just taking the predicted bath bathymetry and pasting on top uh, measured multi-beam, you're likely to end up with sort of large steps and other artifacts where the two data sets meet, because the predicted bathymetry is never going to be ex exactly matching um, the measured bathymetry at those edges. Um, and so here's our final result, upscaled to 15 arc seconds. So you can see um, where we have shipboard bathymetry, the resolution is much higher, and you start seeing, um, you know, much higher resolution um, features in the seamounts and things. And then you have this sort of filtered, blurred um, seamounts where we're just using predicted bathymetry. Um, and so the sort of key key things to, to sort of take away here is that the spatial resolution achievable using this prediction method um, is still well below the target spatial resolution for the CB2030 project. So we can really only resolve features down to around a six kilometer wavelength. So it's well below the sort of 800 meter spatial resolution that's the target for um, the deep ocean in the CB2030 mapping project. Um, but obviously it's still very useful for areas where we don't have any data currently um, and still really useful for the things we do in terms of studying plate tectonics processes and, and there's many obviously many other applications. Um, so finally I just want to touch on sort of the future of this um, predictive bathymetry method and so currently there's a few active satellites Cryosat 2 and, and in particular Altica is doing a really good job um, but next year in two, uh, 2022 um, this mission the SWAT mission is due to launch and this is, this could really be a game changer in terms of um, how we derive those sea surface slopes. So it's using a different technology, and instead of just getting these along track slopes um, and along these NIDAR paths um, uh, below the satellite, it's actually going to be map mapping these swaths of um, the sea surface. Um, and this is really important in that we won't just get the along track slope, but we'll also get the across track slope, which will really improve the eastern component of those grids. Um, the other really important thing is that it's going to provide glo near global coverage every 22 days. So it's going to be like, you know, an order of magnitude increase in, in the data availability. And so providing this all goes well and everything works, um, we, we predict that should could map into a sort of a five-fold increase in the accuracy of the gravity anomaly, and that will map directly into um, better bathymetric predictions. Uh, so just as the key takeaways in terms of creating predicted bathymetry maps, the real sort of processing flow is getting these sea surface slopes from our altimeters, creating a gravity anomaly map, and then converting that into our predicted bathymetry. Um, we, we, we do this for the SRTM 15 plus project and provide it to the GEPCO community for use as the base layer in the 2020 and 2021 grids. Um, the spatial resolution is always, always going to be um, much less than the target resolution for the CP2030 project, but we'll continue to fill the gaps um, in the meantime before um, bathymetric measurements are made. Um, and finally, the predicted bathymetry has improved quite a lot over the last few years, mostly owing to Cryosat 2 and Altica, um, and should continue to improve over the next few years with the launch of the SWAT, method, SWAT mission. All right, thanks a lot. Hopefully that's on time. Well, thank you, Brooke. That was a really interesting talk because um, most of us probably have used the um, predicted bathymetry in some form or the other over the last decades. Um, but seeing how this is actually 
stitching together where it's coming from was certainly for me very interesting. Um, is there any questions from the audience? You can, of course, still type in questions as well if you don't want to speak or if your question comes up later, but feel free to say something and ask. Seems that all. Oh, Kevin has raised his hand. Uh, da, 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 da. Kevin, you have yeah. the power. Brock, um, just just out of curiosity, does the orbits orbit path create any sort of artifact or any sort of um, changes in resolution because the orbits are fixed? Yeah. So well, ba basically, um, where you have the satellites turning, for example, the Jason 1 and 2 satellites, I think it's 66 degrees is, is sort of where they turn um, and you get uh, a lot, you get much more measurements where they're turning um, because they're, they're always, always turning there. Um, so you actually get the sort of thin slither of like um, really highly dense, densely sampled um, ocean. Um, then basically as you move north of that, it's only really cryosat 2 that's reaching the high latitudes and so you really have much poorer resolution in the high latitudes because you just don't have as many measurements so cryosat 2 turns at 88 degrees um, and that's that's been making a huge difference in terms of the resolution and in, in the high latitudes be since before that mission launched um, but it's still much less than um, you know in the mid latitudes where we have a lot, a lot more densely spaced altimeter profiles awesome thank you All right. Anyone else? We still have a minute, but if there's no further questions, then uh, thanks, Brooke. That was really interesting. And I'll hand over to Kim Picard of Geoscience Australia. Kim, um, most of us know her, is the chair of the Seabed Steering Committee. And will update us what uh, has been happening with Seabed in the last year. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Glad to see everyone online. Great presentation, Brooke, there. Um, I will just oh no, share my screen. Sorry. Um, give you. I think, Brooke, you might have to release the screen oh, first. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got it. Is that right? Is it gone? No, oh, awesome. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Kim Picard and, and uh, many of you will know me by now. I'm uh, the program lead for the Aussie bed. Uh, that's the Australian, New Zealand a bit uh, coming together uh, to release some data. Um, and I'll, I'll be talking not everything in here. Obviously, it's an Aussie bed from an Australian perspective of what's been happening. Um, but not Aussie bed controls everything here. So if you allow me, I'll go into an introduction of what is Aussie bed for the one who are not so familiar and present what we've done last year and where we're going. So Aussie bed again is collaborative between academia, um, industry and government coming together. To our mission is to improve the coverage, awareness, the quality, and the discoverability of seabed mapping data for the Australian community. The vision is we'd like to have all the seabed mapping data available to anyone um, and openly available to anyone, and also that any acquisition that that will happen will go um, will take account the need of the various users out there. We're focused very much on five products, bathymetry, backscatter, water columns, our bottom profile and sediment samples. Um, mainly at this point, I will talk about the bathymetry because it's JEPCO and also because this is where we're at. Uh, it's the most wanted and complicated uh, one to work with. So what is our seabed in five steps? So we try to coordinate the survey effort so that we map the gap and we work together, develop quality assurance tools and guidelines so we improve what happens out there and, and the data is better for everyone. Um, about processing pipeline, again, getting a consistent output that everyone knows what it is and can be used, uh, storage and make the data findable, and also how to discover it from a portal point of view. So this is a summary of the five steps to our CBIT. 
What have we done? Um, the, the seed was planted early in 2016, but really it came to life in 2018 um, when the first governance of the OCBED came together with a steering committee. Since then, we, we've been moving leaps and bounds forward and we're still going very strong. Obviously, I'll focus on the 2021. There's a few uh, items I won't describe too much, but we now have a collaborative head arrangement uh, between the uh, for an executive board between five of the Commonwealth agency, and that's what's helping OCBED having a sustainability going on the longer term. So there's definitely a lot of support. So last year, um, I'll work in the financial year. Um, point of view here. Uh, so this image shows the uh, holdings. Again, the Australian holdings doesn't mean uh, that's all of us together. And that's what we released at the end of 2019-20. That was the map you saw. And in yellow was the data sets that were, had been processed and made available um, on the OCBED portal. And again, in a consistent and standardized way. So there were only few from many, um, many identified surveys. Now this is the update for this year. So this is the new data that has been published. It doesn't mean that it's data that has been acquired this year. It's historical and recently acquired data that, that would have been published at so there's a bunch of um, uh, logos on the side showing the contribution from those various um, agencies or um, stakeholders who pushed the data out. So there's a fair bit that came out. Um, if you go on the portal, there's a we've we've revamped it a little bit how you can look at the OCBED index, uh, mainly because there's a bit of confusion that while we know there's all this data, it doesn't mean all this data is accessible. <clears throat> so if you look on the left and uh, you can look at that index in terms of what is available online, whether it is with our seabed and has been processed to a consistent and standardized way according to our guidelines, or it may be that there is a link in there to another repository from one of the partner because we haven't brought it in yet. Uh, in, into a one federated data hub, but you can access their own repository where the data is available at the standard they have it themselves. So it shows where you can access. The other one, um, the other view you can have is we have a contribution. People have released their um, survey coverage or survey data uh, from all the sectors we work with. So I, I kept it very simple. I just talked about the data, but I kind of folded uh, the future priorities and what you will see like very shortly right now. And I, I'm going to go from a data perspective, but also from the tools, because again, so I'll see that's trying to develop these tools that are useful for many stakeholders and ourselves, um, well, stakeholder including Geoscience Australia. So if you're thinking about what are we going to, um, what you can expect for next year in terms of historical data release, we have put in place a publication schedule uh, that you can access on the website. This one is maintained. We're trying to predict what data set will be pushed out within a month. Uh, the next month we have a status in there. You can see whether it's in progress or it's on hold because of other priorities that came up. We are a small team. Uh, this is not a big machine here, so, so that's probably why um, you see a lot of fluctuation in the status, but it shows. Nevertheless, it gives a good idea of what to expect, and these um, data set labels basically can be found as well onto the holdings, so you know where things are. <laughs> you can see we're working with CSRO, so this is GA and CSRO combining effort to pushing the data out because CSRO also has the Marine National Facility, which is the only blue water vessel we have in Australia. So that's a good way to keep um, updated. We're reviewing how we do this process and um, how far ahead that we let people look at what we will publish. Um, 
all of the people here who process data, you know how difficult some time and how many blockers you may find <laughs> on the way while you try to get the data out. So um, there's definitely variation, va variability in when things get access, um, ready to go. So in terms of what new data will be acquired, there are a suite of agencies, uh, again, organization uh, doing some surveys out there. Our best bet is I'll push you to look at the upcoming survey register, which is um, a tool that our CBED had put in place that the organization can put their information in. That information provides whereabout a survey will be happening. So what you see in there, what's in green has been completed. So it, um, already that was the uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute work, but other the other uh, little colored polygon are some of the data that will be acquired or is planned to be acquired. Things could change. Obviously, if you look at the Antarctic, that's a big, big box. There's a big survey going out there. Uh, they won't be mapping all of this, but they will be mapping in that area. And obviously, they'll be leaving from Australia. Therefore, there'll be a big transit going across the great um, Southern Ocean there. One thing we haven't got there, some of those uh, teams that we don't know exactly what they're doing in the next year, but we're always pushing and trying anyone online right now who hasn't got their data in, please to go and join us on, uh, go to the survey coordination tool and put that in for anyone to know. So that's a bit what the plan is from our end. In terms of tools, um, again, I mentioned, I just talked about the survey coordination tool in which people can go put their survey plan where they would like to go. Um, there's also another very useful tool here is that we have the uh, Hydrographic Industry Partnership Program, which is led by the Australian Hydrographic Office. There's a way in there to request to them to consider going and survey an area in particular for the area of interest you have. The HIP is focused on less than 200 meters of water. This is where they're going to work. They are in planning process uh, for a future year. So any stakeholders, whether you're a university um, student needing an area or academia, anyone, any sector should consider uh, putting a little polygon saying, can you go and survey this area? And that will be taken into account into their planning, future planning. The other one, which is also very exciting, is the quality assurance tool for multi-beam data that we are just about to release. It is on the GitHub right now. We're just finalizing a um, few little points at the end, but that we are using this quality assurance even right now to uh, look at gridded data that gets sent to us, look at um, its quality, and is it ready to be just directly published? Um, it's also very useful from a hydrographer um, perspective if if you go out in the field and then you want to look at my acquiring all the things I should be acquiring uh, based on this guideline. We recommend, you know, a minimum for us is the OC bed guideline where you want to have backscatter and, and various items. So you can check some of your data directly and see that that is incorporated. So I'll stop there, but it, it's an exciting space in this uh, in this world right now for us, um, and we are going to be putting a workshop together. It, you've received probably an invite um, for next week. Right now, there might be a couple last minute issues, so um, keep posted um, on the OCBED website for the latest update on that um, on that subject. The other tool that is exciting, we're working hard, is we were successful in a government grant that we sent to what's called the Australian Research Data Common. And then um, so seven other partner all together were working with the GMRT, of which many of you would be familiar, which comes after us, I think, uh, the Global Multi-Resolution Topography. And we're trying to adopt and adapt that tool to allow users to uh, control how they want to define their grid. I'm still working on how to best express this picture. Um, if you look on the right, on the left side, it's basically, if you're an end user, you go look at our CBED or any repository, you're like, oh my God, look at, there are many surveys with different attribution, different quality, different everything. 
But the reality is that end users want just a grid of that area into one resolution and get it all smoothed and not have to do the work themselves. So this tool and what we're looking at is getting that tool happening. Um, so the progress of it, we're hoping to have the prototype out by the end of this year. Um, and we're working really hard on that. Um, so this is the timeline we have had. Uh, we've worked with the ocean modeling community as our prime end user to guide what uh, they want, but I think it reflects many other end users regardless. Uh, we're working in an area called Bass Strait in the southeast of Australia in terms of data set as our, our uh, subset of data set to prototype the tool. And then with GMRT, uh, the Lamont de Herdy group to, to expand that tool. So if you're interested in that, go to our website or there's uh, many a few um, resources to look deeper into this. And finally, uh, many of you, thank you for answering some of the survey that went out in terms of enhancement of our portal. Uh, we've received those and then we have now uh, prioritized which tool and functionalities that should be pushed forward this year into the portal to make it easier to people. Uh, the big vision here is really a one stop shop, whether it's a tool you want to access, whether it's data you want to access, how you want to access, whether it's a workshop. Um, so we really want to make that an integrated piece. So we're going to do, um, we're not going to do everything we ask you to prioritize because there's a lot of work there, but we are going to make a chip at that. So finally, uh, my last words here is we have been working on trying to be very user focused. Um, I think some of the reflection is in terms of the different data contrib uh, contributor providing data into our seabed. We want to greatly expand that. Uh, it's the only way we see that we'll manage to share more data. Um, and really excitingly, we've seen that our portal are getting a thousand jobs or so a month. It's the highest one of it's the most used portal or the second most used portal at Geoscience Australia, which I think is absolutely fantastic and it shows the need for seabed mapping data. We are building trust and we can see that in terms of the investment and the diversification of that investment coming into our seabed. We are growing, doubling every year since we started and um, we just want to make sure we keep not that trend, but we need to keep that trust into what is built and that's why there's a steering committee helping us guide um, the work we're doing and finally i just talked about the infrastructure and tools so please we're all into feedback mode right now we're going to release and need feedback so we can scope what the next work will be and we need your input or uh, you tell us if it's useful or not for you so thank you very much. I'll send you to the website again to find any more relevant information on the program or at the next workshop. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Um, uh, very interesting. Very interesting. You ask, ask, can you mute your microphone, please? Thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, uh, I have immediately one question. You mentioned how many jobs you are running per week, how much data is requested, but we have also in feel who are these people that are requesting the data? Is that mainly students, researchers, uh, the industry to have a starting point, or is that Joe Public going out fishing? <laughs> um, we have been, okay, so we know a little bit, but in the terms of the Privacy Act, there are certain things that we are not allowed to do. We are looking at changing and having a bit of every time someone downloads, say, you know, are you from this sector or this sector? So we gather that information. Um, we know it's quite diversified. We know where they come from. We're just pulling together that statistic for the annual highlight report that will be published in the next month. So I think we could have a, a bit more of that information. But we know it's very diversified. It goes from a sonar company making sonar for fishermen um, to, to student. Um, yeah, it, it's across. It's being used by academia for courses with the geology departments in couple university i know so yeah it's quite diverse yeah thank you okay we have i'll take time for just one more question is there anyone who has another question for kim
There's two questions there um, on the messaging board. Kim, can you answer those afterwards? And then we just press on because otherwise we're running out of time. Is that yeah, okay? I'll just write in the chat the answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. Bye. Right, um, that gives us time to switch over to our next speaker, Christiane Reiser, or Christiane Reiser, um, from uh, NOAF, the data manager of the IHO DCDB, um, who will give us an update where that is at. Um, Christiane, are you there? Yes, and thank you so much for Excellent. pronouncing my name so very correctly. <laughs> you did a good well, job. <laughs> it comes with the um, home country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, let me just share my screen. And let me know, can everybody see my presentation? Uh, yes, we can see your presentation. Do you know how to get that into full screen mode? We can still see your browser. Yeah, let me see. Unfortunately, Otherwise, yeah, I think I'm just going to press on it. Yep. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Christy Reiser. I'm a bathymetry data manager at NOAA and the co-located IHO Data Center for Digital Bathymetry. Over the next 15 minutes, I'd like to provide an update and overview of the IHO's DCDB, recent enhancements that have been made, and the data center's involvement in process, uh, progress in the IHO crowdsource bathymetry project, Seabed 2030, and our plans to move forward. Since I went into a bit more detail last year, I'd like to just give a brief overview today. The IHO DCDB is the recognized IHO repository for all ocean bathymetric data. NOAA's NCEI, formerly known as NGDC, has hosted the DCDB since 1990. Data are sent to the IHO DCDB, where we provide long-term archive, data management, and open access. Data archived at the DCDB are routinely used for the production of improved and more comprehensive bath bathymetric maps and grids in support of both regional and global mapping projects, such as CBET 2030. Data contributed to the DCDB are typically not assessed and reside in the archive as is. It remains up to the users to determine their value and utility for their own purpose. In this way, the DCDB data holdings serve as the world reference for raw bathymetric data, which can be used as the basis for refined and processed products. The IHO strongly encourages member states and other organizations to contribute their bathymetric data to the DCDB. We work with providers to ensure that their data is in the best format for public use, the metadata is descriptive and informative, and to determine the best way to get those data to the data center. Our website provides information on acceptable data formats and resources to assist in the packaging and submission of data. At the top of the page, you can see a link to submitting marine geophysical data to the IHO DCDB. This document describes our recommended procedures for preparing bathymetry data and other marine geophysical data sets for submission. Understanding that organizing data can be quite cumbersome, the DCDB website also provides information and resources to assist in the packaging and submitting of those data. We offer CruisePack, which is a standalone data packager designed to simplify the process for data providers through the use of a simple user interface with pull-down menus. The software generates necessary metadata files and creates straightforward and consistent data packages. The third resource we provide is, of course, us, your data managers. We are here to help, to answer questions, assist in documenting your data, to do whatever we can to get these valuable data archived and available to the public. Here you can see a recent contribution um, list of multi-beam data, including our regular data providers from the U.S. Academic Research Fleet, FUGRO, the NOAA Fleet, and other international data providers. Over the last 30 years, the quantity of data archived in the DCDB has grown considerably, both in area, coverage, and size, particularly in the last decade with the addition of multi-beam echo sounder data. Today, the DCDB archives over 60 terabytes of uncompressed bathymetric data. This includes about 3,550 multi-beam surveys. The DCDB also includes approximately 5,500 single-beam bathymetry surveys. Here you can see those data track lines displayed as data density instead of just as ship tracks. 
I'll go into more detail on crowdsource bathymetry in a little bit, um, but here you can see that we currently make over um, 25 gigabytes of CSB data from nearly 200 vessels available to the public. However, the data you see here, the purple and red track lines, are only a subset of the data that's currently being contributed. This is due to a geographic filter that was implemented last year at the request of the IHO in response to the feedback provided and also not provided by IHO member states. This filter takes into account coastal countries' position on the collection of CSB in their areas of jurisdiction. You can see the filter working here in both the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal, where the data is cut off at the coastal countries' EEZs. Globally, this means an additional 20 gigs of data have actually not been um, shown, they're filtered out. These data shown here in red will not be made available to the public or to national or international mapping programs until countries provide positive responses. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So moving on to DCDB viewer improvements, I just wanna highlight a few of them. Um, our new multi-beam bathymetry mosaic image service allows the user to visualize the multi-beam data holdings archived at the DCDB as a grid and to see the full coverage of the data without first having to download and grid the data themselves. We've also added several new and updated compilation layers from the Aussie Bed Marine Data Portal and continue to work closely with the Aussie Bed team. In addition to providing information on where public data exists, we've also added a new layer that shows known non-public data. This includes the coverage of data collected to support an extended continental shelf claim under Article 76 of UNCLOS, and also polygons and lines that identify known existing data that were acquired but not owned by FUGRO and PGS and are not yet in the public domain. In response to the growing demands of Seabed 2030 project and IHO CSB initiative, the DCDB has been working to rebuild its infrastructure by building a new and improved CSB and multi-beam bathymetry data ingest pipelines. These new pipelines will allow for improved reliability, greater ease of ingest of new data, greater flexibility in allowed data formats, and also simplify data delivery to the users. We also plan to operationalize ongoing pilot efforts to visualize and access CSB data from a cloud-hosted point store. The goal here is that the DCDB could then provide enhanced services along with the data itself, such as the ability for users to generate bathymetric grids of a given area using user-specified user resolution to retrieve data density information and better support the guiding of future data collection efforts. Okay, now moving over to the second half of the talk, the IHO Crowdsource Bathymetry Initiative. So just a quick reminder, um, the IHO defines CSB as the collection of depth measurements from vessels using standard navigation instruments while engaged in routine maritime operations. Seven years ago, the IHO initi initiated a collaborative uh, project to initiate or to enable mariners to collect crowds, crowdsource bathymetry, recognizing that traditional survey vessels weren't alone going to fill the global data gaps. The IHO formed a and tasked a working group to develop an IHO publication that states the IHO's policy towards and best practices for the collection and contribution of CSB. During this time, the IHO DCDB began supporting the effort by building and hosting a data pipeline that allows the public to upload, discover, and download CSB data via web-based map viewer interface. Over the last few years, the IHO has reached out to IHO member states requesting they state their position on CSB. The original 2019 circular letter focused on the acceptance of CSB activities in areas of jurisdiction. However, realizing that activities can have different meanings to different countries, a revised questionnaire was sent out to member states and non-member states last summer, seeking to gain coastal state support for the provision of CSB data gathered by ships within their waters. The letter state starts from the position that CSB is being and will continue to be gathered regardless of an individual coastal state's position. So the question becomes, can that data be databased and made available for wider use? The URL for these new letters can be found here at the bottom. And to date, um, 30 coastal states, those shown in green here, have replied positively. The DCDB will update the geographic filter this, um, later this year to reflect um, updated coastal state positions. 
The questions from the circular letter um, include the following bullet points. I'll let you peruse them instead of reading them all out loud. Um, and the current list of positive responses can be found at the URL posted below. So how do you contribute CSB data today? Well, the bottom line is there's multiple ways. The DCDB encourages CSB contributions through a trusted node. This is an organization or company that serves as a data liaison between data collectors and the DCDB. Individual, da uh, individual contributors are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And if you're interested in contributing or becoming a trusted node, please do contact the DCDB at the email list at the bottom of the slide, and it will also be provided at the very, very end of the presentation. So here are two examples of uh, current trusted nodes. The majority of CSB data coming into the DCDB are provided by customers of Rose Point Navigation Software System. Mariners can enable their electronic charting system log file to record position, depth, and time. Then whenever their software chart catalog is updated, the data is automatically transmitted to the DCDB. Last year, McGregor Germany, which supplies Carnival Cruise Line with Voyage data, data recorders, also began providing data. These VDR log depth, among other data sets are mandated devices for all ships on international voyages. A few years ago, James Cook University received government funding to per, um, purchase and distribute inexpensive data loggers to volunteer recreational boats uh, that are using their own echo sounders and GPS sensors while sailing across the Great Barrier Reef. Um, this data has been provided to the DCDB with the continued hope of making it publicly discoverable and accessible in the near future. And finally, the DCDB has been working with Navco CMAP on establishing a bathymetric feed from their customers to the DCDB. The IHO CSB initiative has been working directly with Seabed 2030 over the last two years. Seabed 2030 has uh, designated funding meant to accelerate CSB activity around the world. The objective here is to collect data in data scarce areas, grow excitement about the CSB initiative, and develop a repeatable regional CSB mapping project strategy. In return, a potential program must guarantee the provision of staff to hand out data loggers to the community, assist local mariners in setup, act as a data assembly center, and provide a copy of these data to the IHO DCDB to be used in the JEBCO grid. Last year, 200 data loggers were purchased and sent to the Institute for uh, Maritime Technology, who are working with the South African Navy Hydrographic Office in standing up a CSB program. Another 100 loggers were sent to, to the Bureau of Marine Transportation in Palau. While COVID certainly slowed down the progress of these programs from delays in receiving the loggers to now rolling them out to the community, everyone is hopeful that the momentum will pick back up this year. CBED 2030 is currently looking for the next location interested in partnering, partnering to conduct CSB data collection. I do want to highlight the IHO CSB working group and encourage your participation. Last spring, the 10th meeting was held, which continued to see growth and participation, including the addition of newly named CBED 2030 and CSB coordinators. The group was happy to welcome Stuart Kai as the coordinator from the Southwest Pacific Hydrographic Commission. These meetings continue to provide good venues to discuss CSB progress and obstacles with a diverse group of observers and expert contributors. The next meeting will be held both in person in Monaco with virtual participation available for some aspects of the meeting. The main focus of the meeting will be to undertake, uh, undertake a holistic review and update of the IHO publication B12, the CSB guidance document. This document has now been in circulation for two years and apart from including feedback from operational use and experience, there's a strong desire to make the document more equipment agnostic with the intent of soliciting data from all sources, not just single beam echo sounders. So how can you become involved? The single most important thing to be done is to have the permission of coastal countries to make data that is already being collected in the areas of national jurisdiction made available to the IHO DCDB for the public use. Become involved in the IHO CSB working group. If you have questions, concerns, if you have ideas on CSB data processing, data uses, anything, come to these meetings and share them. And consider becoming the next CSB 2030, or I'm sorry, the CBED 2030 funded CSB program. And finally, we strongly believe that the best data is open data. So we want you to know that we are here to help. Please reach out to us, 
to discuss how we can support you in your con contributing data or mapping services. We also want to help you find data, and we want to hear from you all on how we can better support CBED 2030. And that's all I have, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Well, thank you, Christiana. Interesting talk. And uh, can I open the floor? Kevin has already his hand up, so I'll let him ask first. And then there's Kim who has a hand up as well. So first Kevin and then Kim. Yeah, hi. Hi, Christy. Thanks for your talk. Um, very informative as usual. I've got a couple of questions. Um, that map you showed showing the track lines uh, of CSB data from countries that have not accepted um, the letter. Is that publicly available? I actually would quite like a list of, of, of countries where there is data, but th that you're holding, but you can't release, because then I can actually actively try and, and, and talk to those countries and see if I can get that data out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will talk to uh, Jennifer Jenks and see if that can be made um, available to you and see if we can forward that along to you. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's, to me, it's just about knowing the fact that there's data there. Even if we can't get it, it'd just be nice to know there's something there. That was all. Um, my second question was about that, that map you showed on the website about um, polygons of data coverage that exist that you can't access um, things like for the extended continental shelf programs. What was the source that you used to generate those polygons of those data sets? I would have to double check with our GIS um, guru who set this all up, um, but I do believe that it was a, um, the source came from Fugro where they provided the shape files. Right, okay. Yeah, because we've been looking at the Dualis website, which has the claims, but doesn't have the shape files behind it. So I was just wondering where you source the polygons, that was all. But anyway, thank you for all your answers. Yeah, Kevin, do you want me to see if we can get a hold of those shape files for you as well? Yes, please. Sure thing. Kim? Yeah, thank you. Hi, Christy, again. Um, I, it just reminded me, I saw that uh, you had a, a slide showing the data compilation um, that we know of, but are, are kind of non-public and not accessible. And that reminded me, because uh, I could see obviously a big piece in Australia. We, um, excitingly for the future this year, we are working with a university, yes, to go through all of the 362 um, open 3D seismic surveys available around Australia to get the bathymetry data out of those. And that, so those will be delivered over, it's a two year project. And the intention here is I can see you've got, there's more in there which are privately held as well. And um, we hope that this will leverage it'd be a good leverage to go with the industry, see what we're doing, and then uh, wanting to release additional data that uh, from their um, their uh, privately held 3D seismic data. And we're also working with Woodside, another uh, oil and gas company. We're getting the index of where their surveys are and uh, trying to release some of the data we have really good uh, ground there so i think we'll we'll start chipping at it in the australian context so thanks for reminding me but just wanted to add and sorry it's more a comment than a question that's excellent thank you so much and i will i will definitely follow up with you on on that and as you make more progress keep me keep me posted all right thanks everyone um as time is progressing we're falling slightly behind I'll, um, Chrissy, if you um, stop sharing your screen, then we can ask Stuart Kay from Land Information New Zealand or LINS um, to give his presentation on what the progress in the Pacific Regional Navigation Initiative is. Stuart. OK, thank you very much. Um, so what we'll cover off here is the um, Pacific Regional Navigation Initiative, which is a New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade funded uh, aid program. Uh, and we'll also touch on the uh, recent South West Pacific Hydrographic Commission meeting, which happened in February. So 
over, over a high, high level image of, uh, picture of what uh, Pacific Regional Navigation Initiative is and uh, at the very high level the goal of the activity was safe reliable uh, maritime transport services in the Pacific that connect people to markets and services and this had a number of uh, short-term medium-term and long-term outcomes and the long-term outcomes focused on uh, economic development uh, that supports that is supported through the maritime transport of people and goods and a safer Pacific maritime transport that supports the well-being of all people and also protects the environment. Uh, and that's then broken down into a number of outputs. So we had five outputs uh, initially. So this program started in 2015 and we're now really coming to the end, winding this up over this next uh, 12, 18 months. Um, so the five outputs there that we really want to focus on have, have an interest, say, for this audience. Um, is really around the data discovery, which was led by uh, the Pacific Community or SPC and the mitigation measures, uh, which really talk about uh, hydrographic surveys and chart improvements. So for uh, at LINS, we had a focus on the uh, five Pacific Island countries where we are the primary charting authority. So we produce and maintain the charts for uh, the Cook Islands, Niue, Samoa, Tokelau and Tonga. Uh, so looking at the first output there, the uh, data discovery uh, SPC holds data on behalf of the Pacific Islands and uh, they led the data discovery um, output and developed a portal to make whatever data was available accessible um, and also to put into place uh, data release agreements with the, the countries listed or shown there on the portal. Um, I think we have also passed this links on to uh, the regional centre here. Um, I'm not sure how successful in terms of accessing data it has been, uh, but the portal makes available data sets, uh, primarily bathymetry, and uh, that's really what the data release agreements have been about, is making the, the bathymetry available to the hydrographic offices that they can then update nautical charts from that. So from this data portal, LINS has used data for the Cook Islands, Niue and Samoa uh, and, and Tonga to uh, go onto the charts uh, and update the chart. So although there is a, a large number of data sets there, there is some uh, repetition, different resolutions of data. Uh, it, it is um, point data as well as gridded data sets as well. So under the mitigation measure output, um, we took, had a campaign of collecting satellite drive bathymetry throughout those, those four countries. We didn't do summer because they had some good um, bathymetric LIDAR that was collected for another purpose. It was collected for a climate change program back in 2015. Uh, we were able to repurpose that for hydrographic um, needs and updating the chart. So the uh, satellite drive bathymetry was undertaken around the Cook Islands, uh, about nine islands and atolls in the Cook Islands, around Niue, uh, Toklau and Tonga. And uh, one of the Figure areas around Niue was a place called Beverage Reef, uh, which was very poorly charted, uh, one to three and a half million, just a little blip on a, on a chart, whereas now we're able to produce uh, a larger scale uh, plan of the, of the reef. And that's then been able to support establishing a uh, protected area around the reef. So the SDB were able to get down to around about 15 metre water depth and uh, pretty good coverage within uh, ideal Situate uh, ideal uh, water in the in the islands there. Then we also had a campaign of airborne laser bathymetry, uh, which was collected uh, in Niue and Tonga. So there was a, a, a bit of a process, a phased approach, uh, STB first, and then retweaking areas for the lidar to be collected. And uh, in around Tonga and Niue, again we got down to depths of around about 20 to 40 meters, and this produced a very high resolution data set. Um, and it was uh, a new sensor type that had been tried and um, gave very high resolution uh, data and as well as uh, imagery. So we collected data over the over the islands and that's also been able to be used by Tonga government for other activities over and above uh, LINS updating nautical charts. Uh, and then 
to cap off, we uh, finished up with running multi beam echo sounder data. This was um, solely in Tonga, and uh, the chart you see on the on the screen there that is has now been replaced. I think with a with an electronic chart that is a, an old Fathoms chart. So this is data, charts with data dating back to the, to the late 1800s. So uh, lead line surveys with sextants, and now we're able to um, cover these with uh, full coverage. And in particular, merging the data sets together, the, the bathymetric LIDAR and also the uh, the multibeam. So where the data has been collected and it's all been all been merged into a seamless data set. Uh, and then all, all of this data, I think I mentioned yesterday, that uh, has been collected through this program, PRNI, has been provided through to the SORPAC data centre. So moving on to the South Pacific Hydrographic Commission meeting, this was held uh, February virtually and uh, we had a couple of items that are of interest. One was uh, a review of the IHO revised strategic plan and uh, there was a we you know, took a gap analysis for each of the countries and that was summarized. So the two goals that are of importance and of interest here are goal two which is increasing the use of hydrographic data for the benefit of society and that has a number of uh, a number of targets which include uh, the promotion of new tools and methods to accelerate uh, in, and increase the coverage and uh, consistency and quality of survey data and then also the application of UN shared guiding principles for geospatial information so that's really um, following on from what Christy was saying in terms of uh, nations opening up their data, getting their data release policies in line so they can actually make that data available to, to uh, data centres. And then goal three uh, is the participating actively in international initiatives uh, related to the knowledge and sustainable use of the ocean. So here they're really looking at CBA 2030 uh, program and making data available to the IHO DCDB. Uh, and this one in particular had a, uh, each of these goals have a strategic performance indicators um, and uh, under the goal three they're talking about a number of contrib contributors to the DCDB who are not hydrographic offices and then potential of total sea area that is uh, CBA 2030 compliant for incorporating into the JEBCO data set. So this was um, I think one of the first we were one of the first um, regional commissions to undertake this this activity and out from that has come some draft uh, actions that have been identified and um, these are uh, these are available I think on the on the IHO website but really it's um, ensuring that the the commission regional commission activities are are deliberately aligned particularly to the UN decade of ocean initiatives. And out from this will be a, a three to six year work plan for the Commission that we can uh, that we can work through. <clears throat> so there's also a session on JEBCO and CBA 2030 um, and updates were provided uh, by the CBA 2030 project director by Jamie and by uh, Kevin as the head of the SORPAC Centre and also by Jennifer Jenks as the uh, director of the IHO DCDB and there was also an update on crowdsource bathymetry. And out from here, there was a number of actions and uh, decisions. Uh, key here, it really is encouraging nations to review their data release policies and uh, respond positively to providing uh, crowdsourced bathymetry data. And that really follows on for what Christy was saying. And we saw there the, the number of countries that um, may have data but uh, haven't signed up to, to making that data available. Uh, and there was also the appointment of the South West Pacific Hydrographic Commission CSB CBA 2030 Regional Coordinator, and that was yours truly, myself. Um, so really keen to um, get into that within the region and learn from other coordinators um, and see what uh, what initiatives and activities we can we can get along, get going. Um, so that's about it for me. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Stuart, for that update. And does anyone have a question for Stuart? I have to admit I have none, unfortunately, because um, I met Stuart a few times in the last couple of weeks, so I'm actually up to date. <laughs> um, 
if you come up with a question, there's always the uh, chat panel, uh, which has been used quite well in the last couple of talks. Thank you for that. And we caught up with a little bit of time and it's time for a coffee break before our afternoon session, which will be um, moderated by Dr. Jenny Black from GNS Science. Uh, and I'll ask you all to thank our speakers of this session and then see you back here at about quarter to uh, two, so 1345 uh, New Zealand time, and uh, uh, have a stretch and a coffee in between. Thank you. Hi everyone and welcome back to the um, second session for today. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Right, so um, my name is Jenny Black. I'm from GNS Science in New Zealand. I'll be moderating this session this afternoon. We've got four talks to enjoy. Like with the previous talks, they're going to be about 15 minutes long each, including time for questions. And again, I'll ask people if they can raise their hand if they've got a question to ask or type it into the chat. And as if by magic, you'll be given the power to unmute yourself and ask your question at the end of the talk. So the first talk we have um, this afternoon is by Dr. Joshua Mountjoy seafloor mapping hub in the South Pacific. Unfortunately, Joshua is not here in person, but we have a pre-recorded talk from him, which we'll um, play now. Thank you, enjoy. Kia ora koutou. My name is Joshua Mountjoy. I am a marine geologist at Niwa in Wellington, New Zealand. It's my pleasure to talk to you today about um, Niwa's surveying activities. Um, and I do apologize for not being able to be um, at the conference in person. So to introduce this, really um, most of the surveying um, that we do at NIWA here is undertaken within the Ocean Centre Program Marine Geological Processes, um, for which I am the program leader. Um, we have a significant amount of long-term government funding that supports science research and also includes um, mapping initiatives and um, curation and processing of that data. As well as that, any contestable science projects or commercial projects mapped within the program. And so essentially what that means is that um, the team within marine geological processes um, manages the equipment, collects the data and processes it and looks after it. So it's, it's very much within our group. In this talk, I'd like to cover um, our seafloor mapping capability, the sort of long-term um, strategy to map our EZ and strategies are reasonably um, loose term in this sense. Um, it is a mix of systematic and opportunic, opportunistic um, mapping initiatives. I'm going to talk a bit of, about a science example that's come on the back of um, some of this um, long-term um, mapping coverage that we've had, um, and a little bit about the opportunities for um, survey involvement. So our capability here at Niwa really runs from anything from lakes and near coastal shallow water stuff right out to the deep ocean. So this allows us to cover all of the marine environments that, that we want to survey um, within our um, EEZ. The, the smallest end, we've got an um, eight meter um, trailered boat that we can deploy our EM2040D off um, and also the GeoSwaths, both Kongsberg instruments. Um, so that allows us to get right up to the shoreline um, and, and cover some shallow water, small draft um, trailered so we can take it anywhere. Very um, useful and a great survey platform. You can see on the front there, we've mounted a system of um, deployment off the bow, um, which also puts our twin um, GPS units directly overhead of the um, instrument. Getting slightly larger than that and, and not trailerable, um, 14 meter Ikateri um, has a um, EM2040D um, mounted through a moon pool in the center of the vessel. You can also deploy a lot of other um, equipment off that, but that's really our survey workhorse. Um, most of our um, shallow water um, 2040 surveying is done off that. Next step up is, um, it's not a vessel that we use a huge amount. Um, it's a, primarily a trawling fishing vessel, but it does have a pot on it that we can put the EM2040 in the 27 meter RV Kaharoa. Um, that's currently um, under design for a replacement vessel. And um, you can see a um, kind of a concept um, picture there from the Naval Architects, um, what that might look like, but um, that'll be coming sometime in the next few years. And then when we get up to our full size, um, 
um, deep ocean capability is RV Tangaroa. It's really New Zealand's um, premier research vessel, 90 metres long, it has permanently mounted um, EM302 and EM2040D um, in pods underneath the hull. And so this is any kind of deep ocean work um, we're using Tangaroa. So we have been mapping for a long time. It goes way back to um, single beam data and so forth, but we started getting into multi-beam mapping in about 2000. Um, and these are just some kind of gives you an indication of the coverage that we have around New Zealand. So on the left, this is all of the um, multi-beam bathymetric surveying that's been undertaken around the New Zealand coastline and, and further out. Um, just a screenshot from an ARC project, um, but the different colours are, are based on different um, instrument types, not by not by different institutes or um, or operators or anything like that. Um, and then we can break it down and we can look at um, just the data that we've been collecting. Um, so the yellow data there is um, what we might refer to as mid-resolution, so 30 kilohertz. So this is all um, RV Tangaroa. Um, we started with an EM300 and now we have an EM302. Um, and you can see that we've mapped a lot of area around our coastline um, and out into deep water, mostly not more than sort of 3,000 metres is probably the sort of deeper end of what we've done, um, a few deeper bits. Um, but there are some big gaps around there. From a science point of view, I think we've probably mapped a lot of the really interesting seafloor and in that there's a lot of dynamic active processes going on there. But the thing is that every time we go out, we find something we didn't expect. And so we'll continue to um, fill in those large blocks of data uh, around the New Zealand coastline to, to cover our seabed. And then just this snapshot of um, some high resolution coverage. This is in the central New Zealand um, region. You can see um, Cook Strait between the two islands there. And these are um, collected with um, going back to our um, EM3000 we had first and now and now the 2040 um, covering much of this and a mix of science and commercial contracts there. So from my point of view, I mean, I run a science program and, you know, we have a sort of commercial imperative as well, but um, primarily we're interested in doing science for the benefit of New Zealand. And one of the things that's really become apparent is that these large regional surveys provide an incredible baseline for um, doing science in the future and, and things that we might not expect. In 2016, there was a very large and quite devastating earthquake, um, caused a lot of damage. For, fortunately, um, only one fatality. Um, you can see on the left there, it shows um, a whole lot of red lines running up along the coastline of the um, northeastern side of the South Island there. This earthquake broke on 21 different faults, um, and quite a few of these crossed over the coastline. The ground shaking was really large, and it dislodged a lot of material off the mountains around the region. And we expected that something might have happened on the seabed too. And sure enough, it did. Um, on the right hand side there, you can see um, a whole lot of yellow dots. Um, and these are sediment samples from a great big turbidity current that traveled um, at least 600 kilometers along the seabed, started right up in the Kaikoura Canyon indicated there related to this earthquake. So we were very fortunate that before the earthquake, we had been out and collected large blocks of multi-beam data through this area. So these are both in the deep water and also up around the um, very, very shallow area that you can't quite see here. Um, and so what that allowed us to do is to go back and resurvey these areas and see if anything had changed um, following the earthquake. Subsequently, um, as I'll show you in a moment, we did see some change. We wanted to go and look and hide details of that in the deeper part of the ocean. So we brought an AUV out from Europe to survey down into the canyon itself. So yes, there was definitely some change. This shows the difference between 30 kilohertz multi-beam grids. Um, here you're looking at the, the pinky reddy colors um, uh, erosion into the seabed and you can see the scale on the bottom left there. This goes up to about 50 meters. So what we can see there is that the red areas are in the upper part of the canyon um, and a lot of material was removed out of there. As we move down, we do start to get a bit of disposition and slightly less erosion. 
we calculate that about a cubic kilometre of sediment was removed out of the canyon itself, but we do think that's an underestimate. It's very hard to resolve um, the changes on the canyon walls themselves. You can just see at the very um, top left of the um, image there, right at the canyon head, a bit of shelf data. And so we do have repeat data as well around there that both shows the uplift of the fault itself and also a whole lot of landslides around the canyon rim. So these um, landslides were very interesting from my point of view, but also um, one of the only times ever in the world anyone's been able to document the landslides associated with an earthquake. And so this um, on the left is a composite image of the deeper water um, 30 kilohertz data with the 300 kilohertz data around the shelf rim. This is from before the earthquake. When we look at what happened after, you can see um, a whole lot of little landslide scars there. And if we look at that, we've got um, the change that happened and so we removed a whole lot of material from right around the canyon rim related to the earthquake. If we look further afield we can see these same landslide scars all the way around the canyon rim um, and so obviously the shaking here caused a massive amount of sediment failure. We wanted to go back and look down into the canyon and I showed you that pinky image um, of the changes down there. We could see what had changed, but we couldn't really see the details of um, what had happened and how that had happened. So, you know, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with AUVs. Um, there's a huge range of these and we wanted something that was going to be able to get us down to the bottom of the canyon, which is um, about 2000 metres deep. Um, and so we um, went, went, applied for some money to use a Hugen um, from Europe. Um, but one of the real benefits um, on this voyage we discovered was the ability to run concurrent operations um, and multiple payload sensors on the same instrument. So the Kongsberg Hugen AUV 3000 AUV um, had an EM2040, so it's a um, multi-beam system that we're very familiar with, as well as other um, sonar, side scan sonar and sub-bottom profiler and a few other instruments. Very expensive, not the type of equipment that we can um, it's hard for us to justify purchasing um, equipment to this level, um, but it's very good to use other people's to get an idea of how it operates off our vessel and, and the benefits um, that we can get from it. So we had a long voyage, 28 days. Um, we deployed the AUV 14 times. It's really tricky, um, quite a um, low weather cutoff for us. Um, and at the same time, we were able to achieve a whole lot of other operations as well. So you a little sample of that data. This is the very upper part of the canyon head. You can see the differencing image I showed you before on the um, bottom right there with a the yellow box around where we are. This is the um, EM302 data um, from after the earthquake um, showing the sort of resolution there. And then we put our AUV data over the top of that and it's, it's, there's just no comparison. Um, we're going from 20 metres to one metre resolution. Within that, we can see all of these landslide scars, rock fall deposits, 15 metre diameter boulders, this kind of thing. And so we didn't have any idea that this um, was what had happened. And so now we can actually look at the processes that caused this great big change in the canyon itself. Um, this is down in the mid canyon. Again, the yellow box has moved down there. Um, and so we could see that there were these big deep scour holes. We know that there were about 30 metres deepened into the into those scour areas. But when we get the AUV data, we can see that, yes, there's scoured out into bedrock, but there's also all of these sediment waves all the way through there that we had, we had absolutely no idea that they were there. We now know that they are gravel waves and made of gravel and boulders that moved down through the um, canyon during the earthquake. So that's just a sort of a science example, an example of the surveying that we're doing. Um, I think there, there are opportunities for involvement and, and the best way to approach this is to, um, to contact myself or um, Kevin Mackay. Um, we, there is a chance to participate in Tangaroa mapping voyages. We, um, if we're doing a sort of small science crew voyage that's um, focused on surveying, then there's often quite a few additional berths um, and opportunities. We can, we can definitely use the help um, to help us um, 
operate the surveys and also it's a great learning opportunity. Um, and we do a huge amount of varied operations. So maybe it's going to be well beyond just um, multi-beam operation and just the opportunity to experience life at sea as well is a, is a very valuable thing. It's, it can be incredibly exciting and, and cool. I mean, I've seen some amazing things that I never would have had a chance to see otherwise. So just summarising that, um, we have a really large EZ in New Zealand. We're, we're progressively mapping it um, and the ongoing efforts through the um, NIWA's um, science programs has, has made a big difference to this, mapping the deeper areas as well. Coastal areas are more challenging, but we're slowly ticking those off. Um, and between Linz and NIWA, we are covering um, large areas of those. There are clear benefits to systematic mapping for science. Um, obviously, just multi-beam is a fundamental data set that underpins marine science, but also that baseline surveys for future change is, is shown to be an incredibly important thing. Um, please get in touch if you're interested in what we're doing or you um, want to find out if there's any ways that you can get involved, um, we'd welcome that. So thank you very much. So thanks to Joshu for um, that talk and for um, recording it for us, despite not being able to be here. Obviously, Joshu is not here right now, so it's probably not really going to work to ask questions. But if you do have questions about that or if you're keen to be involved, um, I'd suggest you type things in the chat and we'll get back to you or contact um, Kevin or Joshu later on if you do want to be involved with anything on the Tangara. Um, so moving on to our second talk for this session, we have Lindsay G from the Ocean Exploration Trust talking about EV Nautilus expeditions in the Pacific. So hopefully, um, Lindsay, you'll be given um, the magic permission. Yeah, there you go. So you should be able to share, share your screen now and um, go ahead. Nice screen. Okay. I think you let me just try and share my screen. It was properly uh, there. Yeah. This one, I think. Microsoft Teams like to do that. Yeah, please. Okay, so we can see your screen now. We can see your presentation. Okay, okay so let me just see if I can do, let me see if I can go and present my then. See that? Yeah, so we can see your um in presentation mode, but it's not taking up the whole of your screen at the moment. We've got quite a big bit on the left showing what's coming up, but th that's OK if that's. Oh, OK, okay. sorry. Yeah, let me just go out of here then. I'll just uh, stop that over. Sorry about that. I'm just uh, right show on there on my screen. I'm just going to try that now. OK, how's okay. that? That's perfect. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. And I'm really pleased to be. I'm uh, presenting from up in Portsmouth. You know, never mind my accent. I'm presenting from up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, I, I'm the mapping and science coordinator for uh, the Ocean Exploration Trust and work with the EV Nautilus. And we're out in the Pacific right now and uh, heading almost your way in the next uh, couple of years. So I thought I'd just give a quick introduction about uh, OET and Nautilus and then that you know about some mapping you've done and what we've got planned coming up. So we're, we're a non-profit organization that was uh, founded by Dr. Robert Ballard and um, we uh, have many sponsors, but um, about 50% of our, our work is um, uh, sponsored by the US government and from grants, but there's many other people that provide, um, and this is the year's sponsors and major partners for this year. The second row is actually we are part of a an Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, and that includes University of Rhode Island, University of New Hampshire, uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in uh, Southern Mississippi. So that's why our major partners, then we have various industry ones as well. Some, but one that isn't there that have sponsored a number of cruises for us is the National uh, Geographic Society. We were set up, and this was part of, uh, um, after an initiative in the US, you, you uh, I think others know of the Okeanos Explorer in the ocean exploration and research group of NOAA and uh, Dr. Ballard set the, the group up to be able to really get out there and do this exploration. That's part of it and it sort of fits in line with the Seabed 2030 uh, goals of mapping mapping where the ocean uh, has nothing now but we also want to explore there. 
So the mapping really forms that foundation to any further exploration we do. But then there's a, a whole other part of uh, the initiative of the Ocean Exploration Trust is uh, technology innovations. We work with a lot of people to try and um, take whatever technology there is to improve um, exploration. But then the other side of it is, which is almost as important as anything else, is the education and outreach. And it's almost the exploration is uh, really just a vehicle for, for our outreach and, and education. So we do two types of exploration. Once we've defined areas we're going that are basically unexplored, we call that the basic exploration. And we use uh, an input from many scientists and committees and meetings that we have. And uh, they provide us the guidelines of where we go. We normally have a lead scientist on board uh, who will be guiding that cruise. They're not a chief scientist, so it's not their data, it's not their research. Their goal is to be able to bring the community together to define that multidisciplinary type of cruise when you go into those unexplored areas. We do, however, do applied exploration where we are funded specifically for projects, and that ranges from uh, uh, Ocean Network Canada supporting their um, network to uh, searching for uh, Amelia Earhart's plane with uh, out of Nicomarora. Our mapping capabilities, uh, we have a uh, Konsberg EM302 sonar and also a Nudsen sub-bottom and we map everywhere we go uh, with that on. We do have other collaborations and we have a, on the ROVs, in fact, we have a Norbit uh, wideband multi-beam sonar that's used both for uh, forward-looking collision avoidance but also high-res mapping from the ROVs. Two ROVs and our primary one is uh, Hercules and Argus, they're a dual body system. Uh, they're down to uh, 4,000 meters, Hercules and 6,000 for Argus with manipulators and sampling and, and those sorts of things. Little Herc and Atalanta is a mobile system and that's just cameras and imagery uh, only on that one currently. On Hercules, yeah, the full range of kind of sampling. Um, we also quite often, because the cruises vary a lot, we also do have a lot of scientists will bring their own sensors and devices and technology that they're working on that we we are required to integrate on the rov so that's always a bit of a moving feast as we change that pretty much for every cruise and as i mentioned uh, this is 29 20, 2020 was a little bit difficult we got out but not as uh, extensive as other years but this was the kind of group of different people we've worked with uh, on uh, as technology collaborators. So some of you know the CECOM University of New Hampshire uh, ASV, and then the bottom image is the National Geographic drop cam uh, that we've used uh, around the place in the Pacific. One of the other important things that's related to our education and outreach was uh, Dr. Ballard kind of thought about this many years, surprisingly, this was in, in I think a National Geographic article in 1982, that he, he raised the telepresence of being able to basically bring people into the science at sea, because we all know it's difficult to fill a ship more than the, the comp bunks you have there. So this was a way to do that. And it's used to bring scientists on board. Uh, so we normally have, uh, for most cruises, there's 100 or so scientists that would be able to get online, get low latency feeds, they can get on the chat, and now sometimes they can also get on audio during a dive directly into the control van. It's also used for uh, obviously streaming to the public. They can get on board and um, they can use it to just chat in and, and, and just use it in classrooms or whatever. We also, in our, oh, and there's Aya on a cruise a couple of years ago who was out with one of our, uh, she was training Manny there, one of our interns on a mapping cruise. And that's a big part of, we always have uh, mapping, engineering, video, science interns out. We have teachers that are there to provide communications. Uh, and they're kind of the master of ceremonies, if you like, of every dive. They're describing the dive and translating our science, geeky science and engineering into uh, public outreach. We also do ship to shore interactions to schools and uh, museums and those sort of things. And there's a significant amount of online uh, high school, uh, kindergarten to high school um, resources. As I say, we do sometimes up to 10 or 12 interactions with these people uh, every day. And so you normally get a, science and a scientist and a communicator, or one of the interns will get out and just talk to kids 
talk to uh, the public about what we do to try and get them excited about uh, exploration and just seagoing uh, mapping and things. And what that does, it's built this core of a, a few thousand people that the goal is that from all the different walks of life and all the different backgrounds, we want them to become the kind of mentors of that future next generation of scientists and engineers. And that's kind of inbred into us that that's, that's part of the role. It's not just doing your science or doing your engineering or doing your mapping. It's to do it in a way that's then a role model for the that next generation and get people excited about it. So just moving on to the mapping itself, uh, we've been out in the Pacific since 2015 and we've mapped uh, it's nearly uh, half a million square kilometers. And uh, I think pretty much all of that is in the public archive now and also in uh, GMRT and, and JEBCO. Some significant years when we moved out further into the Pacific was in 2018 and 2019 uh, with transits out there, the Wiki Seamount, the Kilauea uh, volcano we mapped, Papahanaumokuakea, we mapped seamounts and we're going back again. And then there was a larger transit from uh, Hawaii down to uh, uh, American Samoa and um, the sanctuary down there and then back again. So just an example, that was some of the mapping it was fortunate in 2018, we were, well, not fortunate for Hawaii, but we were uh, coming to Hawaii just at the end of uh, the eruption and we managed to be there for, we mapped that three times, the lava flow into the ocean after the thing. So first time the lava flow was just finishing, that's a USGS drone image taken at the same time. And the uh, bottom image on the left is from our uh, control room cameras uh, as we were mapping along the coast. On the right, that's a, a actually a different uh, a different image, and the red is actually about 200 meters. So the depth changed over 200 meters, and actually the coastline moved about a kilometer in that area, moved out into the into the the ocean. So, in addition, we always map with uh, with water column data. We we collect water column data always uh, when we're mapping with the 302. And this was some interesting uh, features we saw. This was steam, we think, coming out of the actually side of where the lava was flowing down the down the uh, the side of the island. So that was kind of cool to be able to map that. And I think at the time it was probably mapping the latest uh, seabed on the earth. So that was kind of cool to do. This is interesting. This was the in 2019 we were down then uh, long cruises, and these the, you'll see on the right the typical Nautilus exploration cruise. So uh, transit to somewhere map. And we're mapping on transit, then we would do ROV dives. They range from 12, 24, 36 hours on the seabed. Uh, we're also doing non-delaying like buoys, uh, dropping floats. Uh, we're doing Argo floats again this year, deploying those and other things. On that cruise, we mapped uh, through and for the Cook Islands, uh, through American Samoa and uh, through Kiribati waters on the way and provided that to them. Uh, and this was interesting, and, and I think it's something I would raise now. Um, we tried to get approval, and because we're a research vessel and we're doing more than just mapping, we have to put in the scientific research permits that everybody knows about, which can take months. And uh, we actually have to admit it, we screwed that one up. We'd, um, we'd contact that everywhere directly, but unfortunately, because it's a US funded program, we had to go to the State Department and we weren't quick enough. And, and it was really unfortunate we couldn't map through Tokelau waters. And, and I've heard that Seabed 2030 are trying to promote that we better define uh, how mapping gets determined. And that would help a lot, I think. That was really a shame that we missed out on uh, not being able to map through those waters. Our product, one of the differences with us, we always process the data that we we get, we never work on after. It's not for our science, it's for the, the public to, to use. And we finish our processing and all of our products, whether it's an ROV or dive, uh, when we walk off the ship. So we provide it uh, for archive in a process format in grids, GSF process files, uh, and, and those sorts of things. And it goes to uh, NCI, but we use uh, all the UNOL ships in the US, the academic fleet uh, use the rolling deck to repository to catalog and uh, their data and we use that as well we pay them to do this for us and uh, that then gets transmitted through and you can see our cruises in the roll out uh web page and it gets then archived the raw.all files and the process gsf files 
So not only want to, do we want it discoverable and also um, available for people, we wanted to make sure it was usable. So we then provided our grids directly at CBED 2030 and uh, Jebco. And we started working with Vicky Farini at, uh, at, uh, with the GMRT and she took our data and I think she's got over, yeah, it's now probably more than that, 300 square kilometers. But she was going through a process of trialing and, and having others use the tools because as they get more data now, and so we were one of the first to be able to actually take it on board. So now we're producing the GMRT tiles on board so and just submitting those directly to the GMRT for inclusion. So it just cuts down the time for processing in that. We've been working on a GSF, GIS project to make our data more discoverable for people. That's certainly been used in, it's a bit of work in progress, but we're certainly using it more in our planning now, our dive maps, and we hope to have a real time position on our dive maps by the end of the year. Quickly, just going on to expeditions for this year, we're off the coast. We've been into the Lake Great Lake in Thunder Bay a National Marine Sanctuary. We're back to Papahana Makuakea to do more mapping in those green polygons, which will be in your uh, the South and West Pacific area. We're then down uh, south of the monument on some more seamounts uh, on an ROV and mapping cruise. And then the final cruise of the year is uh, some more seamounts that are the uh, just further east and closer to the island on the south of the monument again. Um, again, that's to map and char characterize that seamount chain. So very much a combination. Moving forward, in the next few years, we're staying out there. You've seen the US territories out in uh, there and we're continuing to be out there probably for at least the next three years. So I think we'll be in your area and hopefully uh, we'll be providing that data directly uh, to you as well as generally through ROR and uh, NCI. So again, as we say, it's uh, mapping, as uh, Josh mentioned, that's, it is the foundation and for us, it's the beginning of our exploration. We don't do any until we've done the mapping. So thank you very much for that. And uh, we have got a bigger season next year. So if anybody's interested, we are certainly looking for uh, mappers and ROV navigators and others for next year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lindsay. That was a really interesting talk, hearing not just about the data and how you're collecting it, but also the um, education outreach component and how you're training up the next generation who we're going to need to be continuing to collect bathymetry data for us. So does anyone have any questions for um, Lindsay? I see um, Hires typed something into the chat. Um, anyone got anything they want to ask? I know we're running slightly behind time. Um, yeah, so I think, um, thank you, Lindsay, that was great. If anyone has any questions, I'd encourage you to type them into the chat and then we'll kind of move on and um, hopefully not get too much further behind with our thank time. You. Sorry about that, thank you. Oh no, not your fault, it was an interesting talk. Um, okay, so the next um, talk is from Paul Seaton from Fugro Asia Pacific, talking about Fugro's insights in helping map the gaps. Now, if you could share your screen, Paul, that would be great. Thank you very much. I'll uh, I'll just start the process of sharing screens. Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah, and we can see your screen shared there. Thank you. Fabulous. Look, my, my apologies. Uh, I'm working remotely at the moment, uh, like uh, like many of us are. Uh, so un, uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, share a screen and, and use a camera at the same time with the bandwidth. Uh, but thank you very much for the opportunity of, uh, of joining this week's meetings. Uh, and it, it's really encouraging to see just how much progress uh, the Seabed 2030 program is, uh, is is making in our region uh, and, and how it's just going from from strength to strength. I'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, about Fugo's approach to the program uh, for those of you uh, who, who aren't familiar with, uh, with, with Fugro, uh, we're, we're probably the world's largest uh, independent uh, geodata company. Uh, so we collect data uh, in, in all of the, uh, the, the Earth's domain. We've been fully committed to, uh, to CB2030 for, from our, for, for, for some time uh, and have formalised uh, the approach that we have to supporting the initiative. Uh, and that approach has got four key components to it. Uh, we're currently uh, donating uh, all of the in-transit bathymetry uh, that we're collecting uh, from uh, a, a number of our vessels. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but uh, we're also 
asking our clients and much of the data we collect uh, it belongs to, to third party clients, independent clients. So uh, we, we work with them and encourage them to contribute uh, their, their client owned bathymetry. Uh, we're investing heavily uh, in technological developments and innovations which will support this program uh, and, uh, and, and make the task of collecting that data safer uh, and, uh, and, and easier. Uh, and, uh, and just as importantly, we're also out there uh, working on, on spreading the word, uh, encouraging others to, to participate uh, and get behind the, the 2030 program. Uh, so how have we done so far? Uh, since joining the program, we've, uh, we've, we've delivered uh, some uh, one and a half million square kilometres of, of our own transit data. Uh, about 350,000 kilometres or, or square kilometres of that was donated last year. Uh, that's a number that we're, we're rather proud of last year, uh, as many will understand with uh, the, the various COVID restrictions in place around the globe. Uh, it was a difficult year uh, to, to operate. Uh, and out of that total number, uh, out of our, our, our presence uh, in the in the Asia Pacific region, uh, about 200,000 square kilometres have, uh, have, have come from here. How we're doing it, uh, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, uh, we've got nine of our dedicated vessels uh, which are, are currently uh, collecting uh, transit data uh, full time, uh, but we're working uh, on expanding that uh, and investing in uh, new ways of remote technologies uh, of, of collecting data, uh, having uh, the data collected without surveyors on board the vessels uh, and getting it back to base so that uh, we can process that data and, uh, and deliver it. Some of the exciting developments that we have uh, in, in terms of innovation, uh specifically for hydrography. Uh, the areas where we're investing in uh, at the moment uh, ranges from satellite derived bathymetry uh, to airborne LIDAR uh, or vessel based multi beam acquisitions, uh, including the use of uh, aut autonomous vehicles uh, like the one that you can see here, uh, the, the, the flu grow blue shadow. Uh, these are all tools that can be used independently uh, or combined on projects where appropriate uh, to improve the, the data collection uh, efficiently. So it's, a, it's about accelerating data collection, uh, reducing the HSC exposure, uh, having operations that are, are environmentally sustainable, are sustainable in a commercial sense uh, and, uh, and are supported uh, at every stage uh, by appropriately qualified personnel. Uh, just uh, an example uh, of that, uh, and this is uh, the, the first time that we've done it uh, here in the region. Uh, we are currently engaged in the uh, AHO's Hydro Scheme Industry Partnership Program, uh, the HIP program, uh, where we're surveying in the Lassa P Channel. It's uh, up on the, the northwest shelf, not quite uh, in, uh, in, in the area for, for the group, uh, but it's, uh, it, it, is, it is certainly the same team. We split the survey areas up uh, a, a little bit, so uh, areas that are, are less than 15 metres will be surveyed by uh, uh, the LADS HD Plus uh, sensor. That's the area that you can see there in green uh, on the chart. Uh, this is a new generation ALB sensor with a high powered laser, uh, which has doubled the collection rate for us, making it much more efficient, uh, but we have an impact on the uh, on the greater uh, water depth penetrations we get from the high powered laser or the improved performance that we get uh, in in marginal conditions uh, the deeper areas uh, we're surveying uh, with the parent vessel uh, which is uh, operating today uh, and uh, and the usv uh, the blue shadow one our vessel operations uh, because it's a marine park area uh, with, uh, with, with with marine mammals that we have to be cautious of uh, we're, we're limited only to, to daylight operations uh, so just as a, as a bit of an adjunct to that, uh, we're working, working with local indigenous communities uh, and we've trained a number of them uh, and have brought them into the program. Uh, so they're now uh, trained up as, uh, as marine mammal observers uh, and, uh, and are keeping watch while we're underway. So in terms of how we're, uh, we're operating, uh, what we see uh, in terms of going forward and being able to contribute to Seabed 2030 uh, is a very strong shift uh, to the digital transformation. So we're, we're levering that innovation uh, at, uh, at, at every point in which we can. Uh, so they can see uh, the, the concept of operations where we have the, the mothership uh, and, uh, and multiple uh, autonomous survey vessels working in, uh, in, in parallel. Uh, so to support that, we have two of those vessels uh, in Australia. We're just using one on this project, uh, but the other one is being prepared and, uh, and will join uh, in, uh, in, in future survey program efforts. Uh, backing much of what we're doing, 
uh, is our uh, global network of remote operation centres. Uh, we have uh, eight of these centres uh, around the world. Uh, the key point here uh, is we're able to uh, mitigate against risk by removing personnel uh, from the, the offshore em environment and expediating data delivery. So uh, that surveyors can remotely observe what's happening uh, and, uh, and work on the processing. Uh, it also enables uh, our clients to, to reduce cost uh, and uh, have greater access to their data and gives them more control uh, over the, some of the survey programs that are taking place uh, in real time. Uh, also importantly, uh, by using those remote vehicles, we're significant reduce, significantly uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, so uh, some of the estimates of a carbon footprint reduction uh, from the traditional vessels that we've used uh, is up to 95%. Uh, another uh, benefit from this approach uh, is it is much easier for us uh, to push forward with diversity uh, and inclusion programs. So so uh, you, you, by enabling people to work safely uh, in offices uh, and return home to, to their families on a regular basis, uh, gender diversity, age diversity, uh, and all the, the, the many benefits that brings, uh, we're finding is, uh, is, is greatly enhanced. Uh, so just a, a couple of visualizations uh, on, on how we're supporting that. Uh, so we have the, uh, the, the various sensors uh, operating uh, at, at sea, uh, being uh, collecting uh, multi-beam imagery or, or video data. Uh, we are able to uh, send that data back uh, pretty well in real time uh, via the, the cloud and point-to-point and -point satellite communications uh, to officers in, in some cases, uh, as is uh, at the moment uh, with COVID restrictions and people being in lockdown, uh, some of our staff have been able to access the cloud uh, and work on the processing of data uh, from their own homes. Uh, all they really need is, uh, is a laptop and an internet connection. Uh, and uh, the ROC, uh, the Remote Operations Centre, is able to uh, manipulate uh, the vehicles uh, and sensors in, in real time uh, by being able to access uh, that imagery as it's coming in uh, and, uh, and, and the, and the the various work that's coming out of the data. So uh, all that adds up to us being able to uh, faster, more efficiently deliver the data to, uh, to our end clients. Right, uh, moving along a bit and, uh, and trying to go through this uh, quickly, being conscious uh, of, of the time, uh, I wanted to touch upon a couple of the, the interesting projects that we've done uh, in the Pacific uh, over the, the, the last uh, couple of years. Uh, this is a project that uh, is technically ongoing. Uh, we've, we have a, a capacity building element of it, uh, which we are yet to complete uh, with, uh, with travel restrictions, uh, but, but much of the data uh, has been delivered. So we've uh, surveyed the, uh, the nine atolls uh, of, uh, of, of Tuvalu uh, using uh, high resolution LIDAR. We took uh, author rectified imagery over the top as well and, and combine those products uh, for, the, for the local stakeholders uh, to be able to use uh, to look at the uh, potential effects of, of sea level rise. Uh, but importantly, as we transit between those islands uh, and, uh, and we're using the, uh, the aircraft uh, and its uh, very efficient data collection scheme, we have been able to uh, expand the amount of data that we've been collecting uh, to include the, the sea areas around that and provide that uh, all uh, processed uh, to the end clients to use uh, for, for charting or, uh, or marine conservation or, or, many, or, or any of the, the many other uses uh, that they might possibly have for it. Using uh, a, a similar technology, uh, we were recently awarded a, a topographic LIDAR project for the island of Palau. Uh, and that the data that you can see there is, uh, is, is just preliminary, but uh, we wanted to put it in there. The reason that I wanted to raise this one and why I think it's important is this is some of the, the, the value add that we were able to bring uh, to the program by using uh, the combined uh, topo bathy system. So we were able to capture in the same survey uh, associated bathym bathymetric data in the area and provide that uh, at, at, at marginal cost, uh, virtually no uh, cost on the acquisition side, just uh, some, some additional processing uh, and with the use of uh, cloud-based uh, processing and and algorithms uh, were able to reduce the uh, the cost of that, uh, but it's enabled us to capture large areas uh, of bathymetric data around these islands. So uh, it's it's taking advantage of a program which was designed uh, to collect topographic data uh, and uh, convincing uh, the client and the other stakeholders 
of how important the, the bathymetric data was in relation to that uh, and collecting it all at the uh, at the same time. Uh, and, and for those who are interested in, uh, and know the region, uh, that middle image there uh, is over that uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site of, uh, of Rock Islands, uh, just in the uh, the Southern Lagoons. Uh, so some very valuable uh, data for, for marine science, conservation uh, and, uh, and other uses. Uh, in terms of other things that we're doing, which uh, are somewhat related, uh, and, and this relates really to, to spreading the word, one of the areas that we're, we're also involved in uh, in the region, uh, not, not just uh, getting behind CBIT 2030, uh, is in support of uh, the UN SCAP, uh, the Economic and Social Commission for the Asia Pacific region. Uh, they have a, a sustainable business network where they bring uh, various commercial stakeholders together uh, and look at the uh, at the challenges of sustainable development goals uh, and, uh, and, and other key issues in the region. One of those that we've been working with this group on uh, is augmenting uh, the tsunami detection uh, systems that uh, we have uh, available in the in the Asia Pacific region. So we are taking uh, vessels that are within our fleet, uh, but also working with uh, with other organisations such as China Navigation, part of the SWI group, uh, and, uh, and and some uh, technological help and, and leadership from the University of Hawaii, James Foster and the and, and the team there. Uh, and we're using the precise positioning systems that are on board existing vessels. Uh, we're adding uh, an additional processor to it uh, and some the clever algorithms uh, and using that uh, to trial uh, tsunami detection uh, systems in the region. Uh, as you know, LIDAR uh, tsunami uh, boys are, are very expensive uh, and they're also prone to, to mishap, uh, particularly in the in the Asian Pacific region with uh, the, the fishermen and, uh, and, and other uh, things that uh, that they can uh, interfere with their, their activity. Uh, so by rolling this out uh, with the various providers, we'll add another level uh, of, uh, of marine data uh, that uh, that helps serve those sustainable development goals. Uh, and uh, why I wanted to, to, to raise this one uh, is uh, we've been talking to this group uh, and promoting uh, Seabed 2030. So uh, as an additional extension to this program, as it rolls out, uh, we'll be working with uh, China Navigation and, uh, and, and other vessel owners to uh, equip their vessels uh, where necessary with uh, with sensors, uh, processing units and, and, and communication devices to help them uh, participate uh, in the Seabed 2030 program as well. So uh, we're working very hard uh, with the, the maritime community at broadening uh, Seabed 2030's outreach uh, in, the, in the Asia Pacific region. So uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we hope to be in touch soon uh, with some, some more positive information on that one. Uh, and finally, just to, to finish off, uh, a key ambition underpinning all the work that we're, we're doing uh, with digitalization uh, and the collection of data, uh, pushing more things remotely, using remote sensors, uh, lowering our footprint uh, and making the task of, of data collection much more efficient uh, is, is being driven uh, in the large part uh, by uh, our, our dedicated efforts to uh, achieve a, a net zero carbon emission by uh, or, or no later than 2035, uh, certainly earlier if we can. So uh, with that, uh, look, thank you very much for the uh, the opportunity to to, 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 to to speak briefly today. Uh, and if there's uh, anything on any of those topics that uh, anyone would like some additional information on or anything we can help with, uh, please uh, reach out and let me know. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. That was a really interesting talk about um, food grow and interesting to hear how successful your remote operations have been, particularly in this COVID world where global travel is not as easy as it has been. So I see Kevin got his hand raised. So um, if Kevin wants to ask his question, if anyone else has a question, raise your hand ready or type it into the chat for later. Um, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, uh, Paul, thanks for your talk. Uh, I just would like to do a shout out to Frugro. Um, just because they are an early supporter for the CB2030 project and we greatly appreciate um, all their efforts and their outreach. I think it's fantastic. I do have a question um, out of ignorance of my part about the data flow between Frugro uh, to the NCI, and maybe this is a question for Christy as well. So how does that data work? Do all ships around the world submit their data to a centralised Frugro system that then passes it to the NCEI? Is that how it works? 
Yes, uh, Kevin, uh, that is how we've been operating. Uh, so uh, what we've been doing is, is, is working very hard to optimise that whole process of how do we collect the data, what processing can we do automatically on board, uh, how do we uh, get it out as efficiently as we can. Uh, and so far we've found that uh, by, by automating stages of, uh, of, of that process, putting it in the cloud and, and having that central point of delivery, uh, that has been the most efficient way uh, to date. But having said that, uh, we're not sure that's going to be uh, always the case. Uh, so as our ability to uh, process the data collected from various sources uh, and, uh, and, and, and prepare that in the cloud for delivery, uh, we uh, are, are working towards being able to deliver that to multiple centres uh, if and when required. So uh, ideally uh, it will be uh, however Seabed 2030 uh, as a group prefers the data to, to, to be delivered is is what we're working towards uh, being able to achieve. But just for the moment, uh, we've been putting it through the all uh, one one central point. Yeah, thanks. And, and I see Christy's got her hand up. So the next question is about what does NCEI do with it? So I think I might pass over to Christy for that. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to um, to to give Fugro a shout out too, because they have spent a lot of time working with our team to standardize the process and make it so that every time that they submit data to the archive, it is a, a much easier process on my end to get it in, into the archive. So um, we, we have a, a one point of contact at Fugro that we work with regularly and every year we, we get a data package with all of their transit data and it's a very smooth process. So we're very pleased to work with them. So, so Christy, is, is the data treated as in any other part of the uh, fleet that so I can download it publicly or is it treated as CSB data? It is available through the um, through the DCDB viewer so it is not considered CSB data. Um, it is archived in the in the multi beam archive. Awesome thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, I think we'll um, move on. So thanks again, Paul, for your talk and thank you, Kevin and Christy, for your questions. Um, if anyone has any more, type them into the chat and we'll carry on. So the next talk today is our final one for today from Dr Magnus Vettel from um, EOMAP Australia talking about satellite, satellite derived bathymetry in the Pacific. So Magnus, you can go ahead and share your screen now if you can. Thanks, Jenny. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Great. Let's see what I can do. And we can see your video. Yep. Can you see and your presentation? We can, yes, we can. That's great. Thank you. Great. So thanks again and hello everyone. Um, yeah, it's good to see some familiar faces. So I'm going to talk about uh, some more about satellite derived bathymetry and its role in the Pacific and, and even beyond. Um, I'm going to quickly skim through this part. Uh, EOMAP, that's the company I work with. We map and monitor aquatic environments worldwide, um, mostly using satellites. And that's what we've been doing for the last 15 years or so. Um, our two main offices are in Germany and Australia. And um, bathymetry or satellite derived bathymetry is probably our key flagship product. And we were probably the first commercial provider of this and arguably still the leading provider worldwide of this technology. Very quickly, <clears throat> the sunlight uh, reflects off the seafloor and is measured by an optical sensor on a satellite. And if you can describe that whole process accurately using physics, you can um, reverse engineer how much water it traveled through uh, without any need for calibration data. And hence, you can retrieve water depth. So you need to be able to see the seafloor, which means uh, you're limited to something like uh, 15 to 20 meters in clear waters. Uh, although there are exceptions like uh, off of Lord Howe Island, you can get down to 40 meters. So there's the uh, sort of the, the real world schematic uh, on one side and the algorithmic interpretation on the other of physics based satellite derived symmetry. And the reason to use this, I think many of you will be familiar why it should be in your surveying toolkit. Um, essentially, you can access any location on the globe if the water conditions are right. And if it's shallow enough, it's not intrusive, of course. Um, you can cover very large areas at relatively low cost and very quickly. Um, it is complementary technology, so it does not replace, for example, multi-beam or LIDAR. Um, 
but it has its fit for purpose uh, niche, if you will. Still a te challenging technology to do if you don't have access to in situ data to calibrate, then you have to do proper um, physics based inversions and, and so forth. Um, so again, this slide is just to, to, to bring across uh, again that message that um, it's a fit for purpose um, tool and, and we've seen uh, as the years go by, we see increasing uptake both across sectors, which some are listed here on the right, but also uh, in terms of number of projects and distribution worldwide. So it just keeps, the uptake just keeps increasing, which is great to see. And um, so if we zero in on the hydrographic applications, STB has a few different roles depending on who you um, speak to and, and what your requirements are for your survey. So if you're, if you're talking about an engineering grade type bathymetric survey, you would probably just use STB for planning <clears throat> and optimizing your assets. Whereas in other situations, if your uh, resolution requirements or your budget um, uh, sort of push you that way, then STB might be the tool you use for the final bathymetric data set. So it's again fit for purpose. Um, we've seen STB appearing more and more in nautical charts, for example, the UKHO and, and LINs, and still in a very pragmatic fashion. And, um, and finally, uh, another important part of STB uh, or its role is in monitoring change. Because if you have areas, uh, for example, navigational uh, channels with fast changing uh, sandbar, moving sandbars, um, it might be too costly to go out there with your hardware all the time. So this is where STB can, can give you a quick survey and update changes. So the Pacific, um, this map shows you um, color, well, it's in economic, exclusive economic zones, but where STB has been used, it's not entirely correct because uh, uh, all of Vanuatu is missing as well as other small locations, uh, not to mention the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and the uh, Micronesia hasn't been mapped yet, but it is in the process of happening courtesy of, of JEBCO actually. So this goes to show that um, it's already um, operating extensively in the Pacific, if you will. And since I know this is the last talk of the day, I thought I would move on to some eye candy for a while, um, focusing on the Pacific. We've heard Stuart Kai mention the PRNI project. So, and he, and he explained how this was a, a multi-source or rather multi-technology approach to mapping such a large and, and the widespread area um, where they used uh, multi-beam, so ship-based, airplane-based, and satellite-based sensors uh, to essentially optimize their resources. And, and I think it was very successful and a world first at this type of scale. Um, and there were locations that weren't covered by this project. So um, Stuart Kai and Kevin came back to us uh, very recently for a couple of more um, locations for the Cook Islands. Here are a few of the atolls that were mapped using two meter resolution. So that's the grid spacing for the satellite pixels. This was also done for Jebco uh, as part of the Seabed 2030. Um, this is the Puka Puka Atoll, which was mapped. There's a really gorgeous um, platform there, four kilometers long, connecting the two shallower areas with all these nice spur and groove formations. Here's the Suaru Atoll. And uh, there the imagery had to be tasked. There was none. And um, we, we managed to get the probably the nicest image ever taken of this atoll and produce um, satellite derived bathymetry. Here's some close ups with vertical exaggeration. You see the color coded bathymetry along the bottom and then you can overlay the true color uh, seafloor image, a theoretical true color seafloor image of the satellite of the STB data on top of the uh, essentially seafloor DEM, which gives you those images on the top right. Uh, another project was for um, where the CSIRO was the main client, and this was for a climate change resilience study um, in order to standardize the science-based climate information for the entire archipelago of Vanuatu, where they were doing hydrodynamic wave and biogeochemical modeling with this application in mind. So here we use 10 meter data since it was a much larger area. Um, and here you sh shows the footprint of the satellite scenes as well as the geographic extent of what we mapped. Um, they wanted to see the STB, but also to see it combined, so multi-source um, bathymetry with the ENC data. 
uh, in various resol grid resolutions with or without the SDB and down to various depths. So here's just some screenshots where you can see the uh, S 10 meter STB on the top right, uh, combined with everything down to 200 meters at 10 meter resolution, so multi-source bathymetry at the bottom left, and finally all available bathymetry at 50 meter grid resolution, including the STB. So here's where you're combining the troublesome shallow water zone, uh, which is uh, extra important, especially when it comes to um, climate change resilience modeling, uh, with all available data, which is coarser and offshore. And here's a great example. In the top left, you see the JEBCO 2020 data, um, and you see all these artifacts in the shallow water zone, whereas when you uh, bring in the SDB and combine the data, the artifacts are gone. And I think it's um, clear that it would be a much more accurate modeling of the effects of climate change if you have that nearshore accurate SDB data as part of the model. It's a good example of filling in the gaps. Another example, so we actually saw the type top right image in uh, Kim's uh, presentation, if you were paying attention closely. This is Money Shoal. It's part of a mapping campaign that um, AIMS and Geoscience Australia did in the Airfura Marine Park. So they were out there doing their multi-beam surveys and video towing, and sediment grabs and backscatter. But you can see the data gap there in the shallow part of Money Shoal, really shallow area data is missing. So uh, Scott Nichols at GA asked us to fill that in with um, some freely available Sentinel imagery. Here it is. And then we can combine it again for multi-source uh, bathymetry where you have the merged STB and the multi-beam showing you the complete picture. So again, filling in the gaps uh, using multiple scale and different technologies. And uh, speaking of scale, we also mapped the entire Great Barrier Reef at 10 meter resolution. So this is a gorgeous data set produced uh, together with uh, University of Queensland for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. Ultimately, it's to map the benthic habitats. Uh, we provided the bathymetry and reflectance layers for this data set. So operating at a very large scale um, over a large area. So this brings me on to um, changing topics a little bit. Uh, survey standards. Uh, the IHO has now uh, modified their sixth edition for the IHO san survey standards. Um, now is a matrix-based approach, and it's now possible to specify a SDB survey using this um, S44 sixth edition. So the specifications have been expanded and um, adapted to accommodate for SDB type surveys. So this is great. When it comes to um, charting standards and vertical accuracy, We've um, typically provided an uncertainty envelope. So it's a model-based uncertainty envelope uh, as a function of the water quality, the depth, and the substrate type. So we provide this measure, uh, max and min type of uncertainty for every single pixel, every measurement. Um, but of course, uh, absolute accuracy is needed as well. So uh, especially if you want to fit into the ZOC categories for charting standards, where SDB doesn't really fit in uh, it's sort of lopsided in the way that it's, I mean, these standards weren't de designed for STB type technology. But I'm happy to report that we have a, now an international STB working group, which is, this is one of the topics that they will be ta tackling. Um, which brings me to some developments in STB that I want to mention. So um, on the topic of accuracy, we now are implementing what I, what I like to think of as STB 2.0 which is uh, something we patented several years ago, but it's taken a while to implement, and partly because um, computers weren't really fast enough, but with new hardware acceleration techniques, GPU processing, and a few other things, we're able to implement it, and essentially it's solving the same, uh, solving STB for a location using multiple imagery for that location. So you can imagine our, um, I showed you earlier, the processing schematic for all the algorithms that are used, if you imagine 16 of those operating simultaneously on 16 different scenes of the same location, they're all looking over each other's shoulder to see what answer they're getting, and that constrains the, the inverse engineering and uh, essentially the solution, which could be because it's a multivariate um, uh, solution. So there isn't just one solution for seafloor color, water depth, and water type. But by constraining it this way, we can increase the accuracy for a physics-based inversion. And, and our tests are showing uh, really great uh, improvements. So this is without calibration data. So this means that we have 
greater confidence in their accuracy. Another um, development that's also part of this uh, increased accuracy and validation is the launch of the, uh, of the US um, ISAT-2, which is, carries a LiDAR on board. And it's collecting LiDAR tracks uh, continuously around the globe. So they're a lot sparser. You will not get a uh, or like a rasterized three-dimensional bathymetry map from it. Um, and they're also quite difficult to interpret these point clouds if you want to use them underwater or underwater data because it was originally designed for ice and land. However, you can get bathymetry from it and uh, this can be used then to uh, validate or calibrate SDB worldwide using a satellite based LIDAR. So this also points to increased accuracy and reliability and uptake of SDB worldwide. Uh, we've been developing software which packages up all of this into a standalone desktop software package. Um, so no calibration data needed and you can map worldwide. Um, this is not commercially available to, yeah, commercially available. However, national agencies, um, uh, we do make it available to them. So the, the Royal Australian Navy is using this now. So that's something that will keep coming and we have other software tools also that are that will be commercially available. Another thing to mention is to know where in the world can you map STB. So in other words, STB feasibility. And we've been uh, uh, growing this now and developing this. So we have it for all of Southeast Asia. Uh, so essentially, you know where you can and can't map STB, which would be quite useful if you have a, a campaign to map the entire globe and you need to fill in the gaps. Then it's handy to know where STB can and cannot be used. So we plan on growing this and eventually achieving global coverage. Um, in terms of, I've alluded to it already, this increasing uptake and, and acceptance of STB. So just one recent example is that the IHO um, last month organized a workshop just on STB. Uh, it was by invite only, and it was the concepts, the theory, the use cases, and hands-on practicals of STB uh, software. So just to show how the how the uptick is increasing and part of a general capacity building worldwide. So the topic of um, standards and best practice, this is something I alluded to earlier with the, um, the ZOC categories. Uh, we now have a SDB best practice project team, which is the international working group. And it's actually a supporting body of the IHO now, of their um, hydrographic survey working group. And um, so the topic is naturally STB standards best practice. We have over 30 members internationally and we had our first meeting already in April. Uh, and in parallel, um, we are engaging um, with Oz Seabed um, so we can have some fit for purpose best practice and documentation for their database um, as they would like it. And Paul Seaton has, uh, I think um, he uh, made a great um, yeah, it's impressive uh, the way Fugro has already contributed so much data. So we are nowhere near that <laughs> for many reasons, but we have now uh, officially uh, an agreement with Seabed 2030. So we have a letter of metric data contribution, which now goes out to our clients. So we are on board with this as well in a much more modest and um, we're just starting out, but we are very happy to support this. And at the same time in parallel, um, we are engaging with all the Seabed uh, for the same reasons, to provide STB data and or location of STB data into the Oz Seabed database. So um, some closing remarks then. I've underlined the key points that I want you to take away from this talk. So STB then to fill in the shallow water gaps. Um, there are many reasons to use it, including that it's got worldwide coverage, low cost and, and rapid. There are trade-offs, uh, depends on your, uh, on your application, your purpose. Uh, we're seeing it, um, the IHO service standards are adapted now to STB, but work remains to be done with regards to charting, and we do have a, an international working group for this. Um, it's going mainstream, really, having been part of this now for over 20 years, the journey of STB. It's clear that, um, you know, across all sectors, NGOs, national agencies, down to local consultancies, uh, are using STB, which is fantastic to see. Uh, and finally, uh, the next generation of, of the technology, so the parallel uh, processing, which I mentioned, um, and all the speed acceleration we're able to get, uh, means that essentially it, it's ready for producing global data sets and providing global coverage. Thank you. 
Thanks, Magnus. That was a really interesting talk and good to see the data that it's possible to collect in those shallow areas where it's hard to collect data by more traditional means. Um, I see we've yep. got a hand raised in the um, side. So, um, Peter Jacob, would you like to go ahead and um, ask your question? And anyone else raise your hand if you've got a question. Um, Peter, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Um, maybe um, we'll just um, move ahead. I see Brooks got his hand raised too. Um, maybe we'll move on to Brooks' question. If Peter's around, he can ask his question after Brooke. So if you go ahead, Brooke. Hi, hi. I just I just put it in the chat, but I was just interested to, interested to know if you've um, compared the accuracy of your physics based approach um, compared to the calibrated approach at a given location, and if so, how well did the physics based approach go? So um, <laughs> I can easily weasel out of that one because it depends which calibrated approach you're using. Um, and even more so, uh, it's the calibrated approach is entirely dependent on your input data. So if you have extremely dense input data and it's reliable and you have the right type of calibrated approach, uh, I would say in a blind test, it would perform better than a physics-based approach. Right. Just generalizing broadly. Yeah. But um, you know, you don't often have that, so um, it's a it's a hard question to answer. It's really yeah, dependent. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks. That's great. Yeah, just interested to get a feel for it. Yep. Cheers. And, and to mention as well, SDB is not often used when you have a lot of in situ data. It's kind of not where you would use it. So. Yeah. 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 Cheers. Thanks, Brooke. Um, Peter, Jacob, are you ready to ask? I see your hand's gone down. Perhaps it was a, not actually a question. OK, I see we're kind of approaching three o'clock, so we're probably getting close to running out of time. Um, but if anyone does have any other questions, uh, maybe put them in the chat or save them for tomorrow. So I'll just wrap up from this session this afternoon. I thought four really interesting talks, and I think the reason we've run over time a bit is because they were all really interesting. Um, one thing it kind of I was thinking as we went through them is it was a reminder that we're not just collecting data to make beautiful maps. We are making beautiful maps, but there's a lot of relevance to these data sets. Um, Josh, you talked about mapping the Kayakora, the canyons offshore New Zealand after the Kayakora earthquake. Lindsay talked about the lava flows off Hawaii after the recent eruptions. Paul talked about Tuvalu and um, climate change and Magnus about mapping in Vanuatu with climate change resilience. So a reminder that we are doing this for a lot of really important reasons as well as to collect data and to make beautiful maps. So that was a really good reminder for me. Um, I'd like to thank all the um, speakers for this session, Josh, Hugh, Lindsay, Paul and Magnus. Thank you. And I'll maybe pass back over to Kevin if you've got anything you want to say um, before tomorrow's session. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Uh, I've got nothing to add. I just thank everybody else, uh, everyone on the, for your attention today. Um, and we've got another action pack day tomorrow, um, the last day. Uh, so I look forward to all you signing in um, at 12.30 New Zealand Standard Time tomorrow for the conclusion of our annual meeting. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow.